a medieval artifact, which holds significant meaning for Christian, is controversial. People doubt its origin and the era it belongs to. Scientists do research and find the chilling truth behind the sacred relic, which shocked people. What is the secret of the relic? What is the hidden meaning it holds? I invite you to watch until the end of the video to understand what is the hidden meaning that the sacred relic holds. The Shroud of Turin, a highly contentious sacred relic, has sparked fierce controversy even within the Catholic Church. Carbon dating examinations pointed to its origin approximately 800 to 1000 years after Christ's era, prompting suspicion that it was a fabrication. However, significant information has emerged, casting new light on its legitimacy. Interestingly, a member of the original examining team has publicly declared that the testing procedure was defective, making the results untrustworthy. To make matters even more intriguing, the raw data from these tests was kept hidden from the public for an incredible 27 years. There were also suspicions of financial incentives given to the laboratories involved, possibly to promote the myth that the Shroud of Turin is a medieval forgery. This raises the question of whether there are government entities interested in concealing the secrets of the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin has been carefully conserved since 1578, and it now resides in the Royal Chapel of the Cathedral of San Giovanni Battista. Its dimensions were impressive, measuring 4.3 meters in length and 1.1 meters in width. What made it extremely intriguing were the faint brownish images that appeared on its surface. Looking at the shroud, one would see the spectral likeness of a short guy with sunken eyes who was 5 feet 7 inches tall, with one half of the cloth displaying a picture of a body lying lengthwise, and the other half elegantly folding over to cover the complete front from face to feet. It appeared as though the shroud had witnessed the final moments of a life. That wasn't all though. It was reported that the markings on the shroud bore an uncanny resemblance to the wounds sustained by Jesus Christ on the cross. The head had thorn marks on it like someone had painfully placed a crown of thorns over it. The bruises on the shoulders suggested the weight of a hefty load carried, while the lacerations on the back appeared to tell of a vicious flogging. The stains all over the shroud, which were thought to be bloodstains, were the most moving of all. It was murmured that these stains served as hallowed memories of the supreme sacrifice made on behalf of humanity. It is crucial to remember that the Catholic Church does not officially declare a relic's authenticity. The Church has not declared itself to be more than a mere icon of Christian devotion. They do admit that it serves as a symbol for the mystery of the Lord's passion and death for millions of travelers. Since the late 19th century, scholars have investigated the Shroud's secrets, using scientific means to determine its legitimacy. In 1898, scientists made a striking observation. The sepia tone images on the Shroud bore an uncanny resemblance to photographic negatives rather than genuine photos. In 1988, the Vatican resolved to settle the authenticity debate once and for all. They gave three laboratories in various nations microscopic samples of the Shroud's linen cloth, each barely larger than a postage stamp. The goal was to do carbon-14 dating on these samples to determine the Shroud's age. To their surprise, all three laboratories independently concluded that the textile was produced between 1260 and 1390. The intriguing thing is that, despite the carbon dating results, Scientists are unable to explain the image on the shroud. It depicts a photographic negative of a body, with wounds similar to those Christ would have received. While scientists can safely state that the shroud does not date from the time of Christ, they are unable to definitively describe what it signifies. For almost a century, scientists have tirelessly pursued the research of this revered artifact, hoping for a conclusive answer. However, despite the use of the most advanced scientific technology available today, no one has been able to duplicate the mystery image it bears. Nonetheless, scientific advancement has resulted in the progressive revelation of fresh evidence, which strengthens the case for the Shroud of Turin's authenticity. To begin, consider the thoughts of Barry Schwartz, a member of the team that performed the original inspection of the Shroud and the official photographer for the Shroud of Turin research project. The fundamental goal of their research was to determine the formation process for the image on the Shroud. As a non-practicing Jew at the time, he was hesitant to join the team and questioned the Shroud's validity, believing it was simply an exquisite painting. Still, during their painstaking analysis of the fabric, he discovered one of the image's persistent mysteries, which continues to interest academics today. He explained that they used a specialist device made for X-ray analysis that could extend the brightness and darkness of an image vertically into space according to their density. Normally, 
This method would result in a distorted image, but the shroud made it possible to see a human form in three dimensions. This suggests a strong relationship between the distance between the cloth and the body and the density of the image, or its lights and darks. He said that the interaction between the cloth and the body is the only plausible explanation for this occurrence, ruling out the concept that it is just a projection, because images from artwork or photos do not have the same kind of information as the shroud. They first looked for signs of paint, pigments, or binders that would indicate the image was created artificially, but they found nothing. Upon closer inspection, however, they discovered that the image was made up of yellow-colored strands that were concentrated to determine how dark a particular spot was. To put it simply, there was no proof that the image had been created by any external material or influence. Even nevertheless, the shroud's authenticity was finally determined to be a lie by a radiocarbon test carried out ten years following their investigation. Barry draws attention to the dubious fact that it took a laborious 27 years to obtain the raw data from the British Museum, which oversaw the three labs that carried out the radiocarbon testing under the Freedom of Information Act. In scientific practice, data release with such a long delay is quite rare. As a common component of the scientific method, scientists typically publish their work in journals and make the raw data available to other researchers so they can confirm or build upon their discoveries. When the raw data was eventually acquired, it clarified the reasons behind the hesitation to make it public. According to the data, the sample obtained from the shroud was not homogeneous, means it was a piece of cloth with one date at one end and a different date located at the opposite end hundreds of years later. As a result, no one location on the strip could be positively associated with the cloth's overall date. In addition, they neglected to collect any control samples a necessary step for accurate radiocarbon dating from other parts of the shroud. Evidence of interlaced cotton may be found in the corner where the sample was obtained. Jewish law, referred to as the mixing of the kinds, forbids coupling cotton with linen or wool with cotton. This discovery goes against that commandment. High-status burial shrouds are typically composed of pure linen, but the cotton found in the corner suggests that the shroud may have been repaired or rewoven in that spot. As a result, the shroud's repaired corner was used for radiocarbon testing, which made it impossible to determine an accurate age for the remaining portions of the cloth. Doubts about the researchers' objectives surfaced as soon as the findings, that the shroud was medieval, were leaked ahead of its formal release. An unidentified donor gave the British Museum a considerable sum of one million pounds sterling with the express purpose of disproving the shroud. This money went to the Oxford Laboratory, one of the three labs that examined the shroud. This begs the question, are there powerful organizations with a stake in disproving the shroud's veracity? Additionally, blood chemistry has been used to look for proof that the fabric is real. It had blood stains of type AB, which are uncommon in the general public but more typical among Jews. The blood had a remarkably bright red tint that defied age, suggesting the unspeakable pain that the people encased in the shroud had to go through. The bloodstains that cascaded down the arms were unmistakable proof of a brutal crucifixion, since the victim's actions exactly matched the angle at which the blood flowed. Remarkably, the bloodstains appeared before the picture on the shroud, meaning that the remarkable change happened exactly 72 hours after the blood came into contact with the cloth during the special image-forming process. After more examination, scientists revealed that the dirt on the shroud included Jerusalem limestone, which is the same limestone that is found in Jesus' tombs in Jerusalem, along with travertine aragonite. This discovery presented some fascinating possibilities. Furthermore, the fabric had 49 varieties of pollen, 33 of which were found only in Palestine, and three of which were found only in Jerusalem, suggesting a possible connection to the notorious crown of thorns. Furthermore, by using sophisticated wide-angle X-ray scattering, researchers were able to date the fabric with greater accuracy and reliability. Scientists studying the eyes of the man in the shroud found small evidence of antique coins from the first century that were used in Jewish graves. These coins match those used by Pontius Pilate in the same period. In addition, the shroud's dimensions, two by eight cubits, are strikingly similar to an antiquated unit of measurement. The shroud is notable for having a three-inch wide side strip that was sewed using a special stitch that was only employed in Palestine in the first century, creating a strong link to the past. Over the ages, creative representations of the crucifixion usually featured nails going through the hands. Archaeological discoveries, on the other hand, suggest that the nails were truly driven into the wrists, 
which is consistent with the image on the shroud. The head wounds also precisely resemble thorns, which is strikingly consistent with the biblical story of the crown of thorns. The bruises on the shoulders point to times when the wearer stumbled and fell while carrying a large, awkward object, possibly over blood-stained ground. Injuries on the nose, which could be from a fall or a beating, give the story of the shroud more credibility. Not to be disregarded, the side wound resembles an oval wound that is two inches broad, just like a Roman spear. The extraordinary separation of blood and clear blood serum visible in the reverse image of the shroud is similar to what is seen after a person passes away from a wound. This uncanny similarity to the biblical stories as related in John's Gospel heightens the shroud's mysterious appeal. Together, these startling details paint a picture of a single man and an incredible historical narrative the life of Jesus Christ. Inscriptions that defy interpretation have also been found by scholars, hidden within the fabric. These discoveries are amazing. Clearly defined writing may be seen in three separate lines next to and below the chin. How were these markings deciphered? By meticulously cutting the official shroud photos into many squares and examining their optical properties with sophisticated visualization methods. Vatican expert Barbara Frail used computer-enhanced photographs of the shroud to read barely scrawled inscriptions in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin strewn all over the fabric. Her research indicates that the words contain the Greek name for Jesus of Nazareth. She claims that this conclusion rules out the text's medieval provenance since, at the time, no Christian, not even a forger, would have addressed Jesus without denying his divinity. If you did anything different, you might get called a heretic. Furthermore, she took the phrases out of enlarged images of the shroud and showed them to specialists, who concurred that the writing style was characteristic of the first century Middle East, which is where Jesus lived. Thus, the issue that needs to be answered is, how did the image end up on the cloth in the first place? Many hypotheses have been proposed in an effort to solve the puzzle of how it came to be. A significant figure in scientific examination of the shroud, Raymond Rogers of the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, contended in 2002 that the image might be explained by a straightforward chemical change. He hypothesized that even mild heat, maybe about 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature that a corpse could momentarily reach in the event of hyperthermia or dehydration, might be sufficient to cause the sugary carbohydrate molecules on cotton threads to turn discolored. Rogers emphasized that no miracle is necessary. Although this concept is comfortingly commonplace, there isn't much data to back it up in this particular situation. After all, seeing it on burial shrouds is not a typical occurrence. According to a different idea, the fiber's discoloration happened as a result of a chemical interaction with something the body released. French biologist Paul Vignon hypothesized in the early 1900s that this material may have been ammonia, which is produced when urea in sweat breaks down. This explanation, however, is inadequate, since the resulting image would be too hazy. Biophysicist John DeSalvo proposed another explanation in 1982, stating that the material might be sweat-derived lactic acid. When chemicals released from plant leaves react with paper fibers, this compound is known to produce dark, negative images similar to the Volkringer images of leaves placed between book pages for an extended period of time. But one explanation in particular sticks out. According to a researcher by the name of John Jackson, Vacuum UV light is still the only likely reason why the image formed. Light radiation is needed to turn linen into a properly photosensitive material, but it needs to be free of any concomitant heat radiation. An incredible several billion watts of light radiation would be needed to create the image on the shroud, which is much more than what is currently known about UV radiation sources. The cloth would have melted in less than 1 40 billionth of a second if the accompanying heat energy had been there. An amount of power higher than the total electrical energy produced by our planet combined would be required for such a procedure. It becomes clear that such an event could only be explained by a miracle from the Almighty God. While millions of committed Christians view the Shroud of Turin as an unmatched representation of Jesus' immense suffering to redeem humanity, others may reject it as a hoax. It becomes more than just cloth and becomes an enduring symbol of faith that uplifts people's spirits and emotions all throughout the world. And you know what? Jesus will bring another sacred long-lost relic when he returns to the earth. The relic itself is considered as God's presence. You guess right, it is the Ark of the Covenant. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that when he returns, he will bring the Ark of the Covenant with him to show us the way to righteous path, the only way he can save the people. 
but before our Lord return with the sacred relic, we must know its origin and history. The Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says that after Israel's defeat in the Battle of Ebenezer, the elders of Israel made the decision to bring the Ark onto the battlefield to help them fight the Philistines. They lost 30,000 men and were badly defeated once more. Hophni and Phinehas were slain, and the Philistines took possession of the Ark. A messenger arrived to Shiloh immediately after learning of its capture, with his clothes rented and with earth upon his head. When word of the Ark's capture reached them, Eli, the old priest, passed away. His daughter-in-law, who was pregnant at the time, called the son Ichabod, which means the glory has departed Israel in reference to the Ark's disappearance. At Ichabod's birth, his mother passed away. The Philistines moved the Ark about their nation, experiencing calamity at each location. It was positioned in the Dagon Temple at Ashdod. After being put back in his proper place, Dagon was discovered prostrate and broken the next morning. The previous morning, he had been found prostrate and bowed down before it. Tumors struck the residents of Ashdod, and a rodent plague spread throughout the region. I think this was the bubonic plague. The inhabitants of Gath and Ekron, where the Ark was progressively taken away, were also struck with malignancies. Following seven months of being among them, the Philistines, acting upon the recommendation of their diviners, gave the Ark back to the Israelites along with a gift made up of golden representations of the tumors and mice that had afflicted them. The Beth Shemites offered burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the Ark was erected in Joshua's field. The men of Beth Shemesh looked curiously at the Ark, and the Lord punished them by striking down seventy of them, or fifty thousand and seventy in some translations. The Ark was transported to the home of Abinadab, whose son Eliezer was sanctified to maintain it, after the Beth Shemites sent a delegation to Kirjath Jerim, also known as Baal Judah, to have it removed. For twenty years, Kirjath Jerim remained the location of the Ark. The Ark was present in the army when Saul encountered the Philistines, but the king was too eager to study it before going to war. According to the First Chronicles 13.3, throughout Saul's reign, the people were not used to consulting the Ark. The Meaning of the Ark of the Covenant the Holy Spirit did not enter the hearts of believers prior to Jesus' crucifixion. Christians now can call on God at any time and are constantly in His presence. The Israelites were not afforded such privilege. The presence of God was symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant. Scripture offers multiple instances of this. To enter the Promised Land, the Israelites had to cross the Jordan River in Joshua 3. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant were to be followed. Joshua commanded the people to consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you, according to verse 5 of the Bible. Today, I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses, declares the Lord the following day. Joshua 3, 7. The rivers were controlled, so that the Israelites might cross the river when the priests lowered the ark into it. The chest was taken out, and the river filled with water once more, once everyone had crossed over. The Israelites were able to cross the Jordan River safely because to the Ark, which stood for God's presence. The Ark played a crucial role once more in Joshua 6 as the Israelites proceeded on their trip. The people were pressed up against the wall of Jericho, where nobody entered and nobody left. Joshua was given a six-day mission by the Lord to have armed men march around the wall. The Ark of the Covenant was carried by priests who led the procession and blasted trumpets. The walls of Jericho collapsed after the marching army was ordered to give a loud scream on the seventh day. The people seized control of the city by following the Lord's instructions. Verses 27 to 28. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Mark the conclusion of the chapter. The army that marched in the ark demonstrated God's might and presence, which brought down the walls of Jericho. In the first Samuel 4, the significance of the ark is validated. The Israelites were suffering terrible losses in their battles with the Philistines. In the hopes that having the Ark would help them fight their foes, they made the decision to acquire it. The Philistines grew tired of the idea that a deity had broken into their camp when it arrived. They defeated the Israelites in battle and took the holy item. The statue of their false deity kept dropping in front of the Ark even after they had placed the prize in the Dagon's temple. The Philistines decided to get rid of the stolen property and move it to the city of Gath, when the Lord delivered them additional destruction. But Gath suffered the same terrible fate and moved the chest to a third city where the populace was once more struck with destruction. Seven months later, the Philistines finally decided they could take no more. The Ark had to be given back to the Israelites. 
that shows how sacred and divine the Ark of the Covenant was. And that is why Jesus Christ will bring the Ark of the Covenant back with him when he arrives a second time on earth. Prepare for end time. <laughs> Here's a prophecy from the Bible about what the world will look like shortly before the return of Christ. As you read through it, try thinking about what you'd need in order to survive it. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Revelation 6, 12-17 even if you've stockpiled enough survival rations to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool, built a bunker that could withstand a nuclear holocaust, and hoarded enough guns and ammo to fend off the standing army of a small country, it won't be enough. When the great day of his wrath has come, when the earth shakes the mountains and the islands out of place, when stars fall from heaven and the sky recedes like a scroll, when kings and slaves alike cower in fear at the judgment God is raining down on a corrupt earth, all the physical preparation in the world won't make an ounce of difference. Being prepared for the end times doesn't require exactly predicting the end times. Paul warned that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5.2, English Standard Version. The day of the Lord is undoubtedly approaching, and we shouldn't be surprised by its unexpected appearance. 1 Peter 5.1.5 However, Jesus himself instructed his followers to be on guard, saying, Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect, verse 44, and for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, Matthew 24, 42. Just like putting together a disaster supply kit, it's important to prepare before things get bad. And just as you can refer to a checklist to assemble your own kit, you can also refer to the spiritual checklist God has provided in order to prepare for these big end-time events. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6 8. While assembling a disaster supplies box can be completed in a single day, developing the character traits of walking humbly, loving mercy, and doing justice will take a lifetime to master. God doesn't expect us to have perfected these attributes before the end time events unfold. He just expects us to be diligently working on them, Every day gives us new opportunities to be doing just that. But the story doesn't end there. When God the Father and Jesus Christ set their plan in motion, they were not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9. In the aftermath of the end time events, the world's survivors will need leadership, compassion, and guidance. We will have the privilege of providing all those things as we reign with Christ for a thousand years, Revelation 24 teaching the rest of humanity to build their own spiritual survival kits, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And one day, when the dead small and great, verse 12, are returned to life and brought before God, we'll be there too, offering a hope for survival that stretches on into eternity. We prepare for the end times not so much so that we can physically endure it, but rather so that we may look forward to an amazing future that lies beyond it. Furthermore, there shall be no more death, sorrow, or crying in that glorious future. According to Revelation 21, 4, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, 
If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Ear. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all things and you sustain all of life. I come to you, acknowledging that your will is best and that your plan is far greater than any I could ever ask for or imagine. Lord, I come to you with troubles that are weighing on my heart and the hearts of many believers. God, I know that you carry all burdens, and I ask that you share your yoke with us, know during this difficult time. God, you are a God of healing. If it is in your will, I ask that you heal, fill in the blank. But I know that whether you choose to heal them or not, that everything will work out according to your purpose. May I seek you in good times and difficult and learn to trust you more every day. May you increase and I decrease as I learn to become more like you. In Jesus' holy and powerful name, amen. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for upcoming videos.